And welcome back, everyone, to the Spiritual Bazaar. This is A, and you're listening to an audio cast by someone on the road to recovery while exploring spiritual paths and the mysteries of life. Um, today, I have a guest who I think will be a great, great interest to so many um, younger people out there who are maybe just coming to the program and or any age actually, just coming into a program of recovery and may have some inner conflict about what the process is for them as far as spirituality because when you come into most 12-step programs, you find that there is a sort of older archetype to the way it was set up and that's because it started uh, the original AA program started around 1938 I believe and and so there is what some might perceive as sort of like an older dustier version of recovery Um, I use a traditional 12-step program and you know I'm sticking to that and it works for me but um, reading works by Charlotte Castle I think will also help fill any missing links that you have with your spirituality when um you know looking at the the programs that are have been in existence for so long so my guest is author charlotte castle uh charlotte castle has an ma in piano from the university of michigan a phd in counseling from ohio university in 1982 she was a licensed psychologist in minnesota for 15 years and is currently a licensed professional clinical counselor in montana She is a certified addiction specialist in the areas of chemical dependency and sexuality and has had a private psychotherapy practice for more than 30 years. She is the author of nine books and numerous articles. Charlotte has traveled extensively researching Many Roads, One Journey. This is the book that we're going to be highlighting today. Um, She's interviewed Native American groups on the reservations in Montana in her inner city in Minneapolis, um, African-American, rural white women, corporate executive white men, lesbian groups. Um, And her question to them is, what helped you get sober? What helps you stay sober? What helps you be a functioning person? For example, 95% of the women had psychotherapy, often for trauma. She sees trauma, neglect, being marginalized as all sources of addiction. Uh, Trauma, which would be childhood abuse, neglect, other traumas, extreme poverty, led to dysregulation of the body, mind, spirit, physical system. People use various drugs, including alcohol, to manage the overwhelming feelings, anxiety, self-loathing, so many of these things we've talked about on the show already. Um, It is crucial in her words, for most people to process the underlying trauma to create a true sobriety that extends to being able to relax, focus, and build confidence. Um, So the book that we'll be talking about today, again, is Many Roads, One Journey. And unfortunately, I've not yet had a chance to read the book before the interview. Um, But then again, that's kind of makes it a little bit more exciting for me because Charlotte will hopefully enlighten us on what the um, details of her book are about. And I will say this, she's made modifications to a traditional 12-step program, which means she has created something called a 16-step. So, Charlotte, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, so I think my, my first question to you is, what why did you get involved in writing about addiction and recovery? Well, uh, several reasons. When I was in college, in graduate school, we had they had one class at Ohio University in counseling for alcoholism, and that was very rare in those days. And uh, I was fascinated by it, and it was very 12-step oriented. This is the one way, the only way, et cetera. And I had, had, there are lots of reasons, but this is a, a, 
little one. And yeah, I was off a, at a salvage store right before class and said, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late to class. And this man standing beside me said, well, what class? And I said, well, I'm counseling alcoholism. Oh, he said, I've had that problem. And I said, yeah, really? And he said, oh, God, yeah. He said, it cracked up my car. My wife was going to leave. And then I said, oh, well, did you go to AA? Because I was taught you had to do that. And he said, nah, nah, I just quit. It was going to ruin my life, and I stopped. And when I got back to class, I told this story, and I was soundly put down. It's like, well, then he couldn't really be an alcoholic, or he's going to relapse any minute. I was just stunned at the closed-mindedness, and we're talking professor here, uh, to any alternatives, any other situations. And so I started asking people. I have a curious bent. Uh, and I found there were a lot of people who just quit on their own and a lot of people who didn't. You know, some people AA was great for, <clears throat> but I started hearing all kinds of stories how people really didn't fit with AA. It didn't feel good to them. And they were always told, if you don't come, you're going to die. And it was like fear and threats and um, didn't sound very good. Now, other people love their program and they got a lot of help from it. And I certainly would never deny that. And I absolutely honor all healing. Just getting out from under these addictions is just heaven. It's it's a spring morning. It's the best thing to do. <clears throat> but a lot of people weren't making it. So I uh, that was one thing that kind of got me thinking. Another one was uh, I was at a women's therapy collective, and several women would come in really depressed. And their sponsor had said, well, do a fifth step, which is, you know, is the well, fourth and fifth step. Take a moral inventory and a fearless moral inventory. And that was probably in my mind as a psychologist, one of the worst things you could do. Because when you're depressed, that's all you're doing all the time is thinking of how wrong you are, how bad you are, how you screwed up. All that's going on anyhow. What we know from research with Depression is you need to say, here's what I know how to do. Here's what I'm good at. Or if you can't get that far, take a walk around the block. Eat something good for you. Eat an apple. <laughs> Anything that takes control. You want to build yourself up. You want to feel like you're an okay person. Because depression has such distorted thinking. So, Well, have you ever been depressed yourself? Oh, God, yes. Mm-hmm. And, I was, and, was terribly depressed in my um, 20s when I was married. Yeah, I got a divorce. I went to England and studied piano and came back and got a job teaching at a university. And I really worked on how not to be depressed. I could I could write a book on that, too. Um, yeah. yeah, I haven't been depressed through all kinds of losses and deaths and things in my last 40 years of life. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was terribly depressed. So you're depressed, you said, um, because of your marriage or just happened to be during that period? Well, I was all of the above. I, all of the above, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't brought up to have much self-esteem. I wasn't assertive. I couldn't speak up for myself. I didn't have my voice. People don't believe that now, but it's true. And I was just like, quote, codependent, to use that term. I monitored my thoughts and what I did to please my husband, which didn't work anyhow. I always kept uh, studying the piano. All that time I taught piano, I studied piano, and that was my that was my help, my guide, my God, my everything. It helped me so much because I could get into the music and, and go away from all the, the world and feel good and feel myself. So that was wonderful for me. But it didn't what? solve the problem. <laughs> well, yeah, and I have to wonder, I guess, because you, you know, had a depression and that was related to a relationship, and a lot of your work um, emphasizes what it is like for a woman. How does a woman deal with um, relationships and addiction? I'll just go through a list of some of your your books. Um, one is If the Buddha Got Stuck, a handbook for change on spiritual path. Um, if the Buddha dated, if the Buddha married. Women, Sex, and Addiction, A Search for Love and Power, 
um, finding joys, if the Buddha had a kiss, etc. Um, yeah. And so, and when I and when you know people look up Charlotte Castle online, they they find a lot about women being empowered. Um, so I I wonder when you were first, you know, exploring addiction and recovery, did you always have a sort of emphasis on women because of your own sort of personal um, perspective? Yes, although I would just add, those books aren't just for women. Lots of people write from Many Roads, One Journey, and the Buddha books. Uh, you know, far more women read those kinds of books, but I get letters from men as well that have been helped by those. So they're not just for women. Sure. And they're also right, and I, I didn't mean that to come yeah. off the relationships. Um, I just mentioned those other books because you had come out of a relationship. But yeah, I understand those are definitely um, for all people. Uh, but overall, I mean, you know, I think that your your book, Women, Sex, and Addiction, had uh, a major impact. Yeah, that was definitely focused on women. There was mm-hmm. uh, nothing written, not a word, basically, for women going into these sex addiction groups back in the uh, oh mid '80s. In I don't know exactly when it started in Minneapolis, and uh, there was a, a book by a man that that people were reading a lot, and women had nothing and I know women would try to understand themselves through reading that very book by a man and I remember saying in a therapy group I led gosh wish there was something by a woman and then someone piped up and said well why don't you write something and I thought me and then a oh, bingo I it just caught me and I thought well why not and I had a lot of synchronistic events that led me to that but yes that was research with a lot of women and I have one chapter where I interviewed a, a man's sex addiction group, which was just a fabulous interview. And I put that in the book, too. So that's that's in there as well. But for sure, it's it's a small part. Yeah. Well, it's actually interesting you say that because um, it is healthy, I think, um, you know, for men, women, um, heterosexual, homosexual, whatever, um, you know, you sort of have an affinity with a, a certain group of individuals. And so often um, there'll be uh, recovery meetings, particularly for those people, um, you know. But then I, I remember hearing a story once where, um, you know, the woman had had gone somewhere. She traveled, um, was looking for a meeting. And the only thing she found was the meeting it, it, uh, with whatever name. It didn't say anything else and uh, th- that she knew of. And she walks in and it's all men. And she's, oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, and goes to walk out. And they're like, wait, 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 no, come in, come in. And then they just change the meeting, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I, I love this about the openness of, of recovery programs um, because we recognize that, yes, we need to be with some of um, like-minded people because there are certain things that I think that that group of people understands better about each other. Um, but then there is that crossover obviously every day in your typical meeting that said i feel that something like that chapter you mentioned in your book is extremely important because even though as a man i might go to a meeting that's just for men and i because i feel safer talking about certain things it has to be beneficial for women and vice versa to understand what those men are talking about privately at some point you know, and I, I think that's a very, very important point that you, you made. Well, I, w- I would underscore at some point because women have been taught to try to be understanding of men all the time. Mm-hmm. And what women need to do is start understanding themselves. Right, women are right. taught to listen to themselves, value what they think. I mean, I was brought up, you know, I'm getting up there and brought up that men were it. You know, there were hardly any women in law school, medical school when I went to university. It was a different world, and women are definitely brought up to value men's work. And the women would stand in the other end of the room talking about babies and all that stuff, you know, that was quite frowned upon. You know, it's not the real thing to talk about. And that's changed a lot. But I would, I would like to say, address what you're talking about a little bit. I was in Minneapolis, which was just the best place to be for researching this and writing it. I'm not sure I could have done it anywhere else. For example, there was a lesbian treatment program. 
And we're talking the 80s now, so that's a, a quite a difference. And the Hennepin County treatment program had maybe a 6-7% success rate with lesbian women. And that's pretty much average for a lot of treatment programs. Maybe some do 10 to 15%. Well, the local one had about a 70% success rate. Now one asks why? Well, because if you're in the closet and ashamed of who you are as a lesbian, if you've been punished for it, if you can't talk about your life at work, it invades your whole life. And that's no place that, you, you know, AA isn't going to work to talk about that kind of oppression. It's not designed for that. So those women started out saying, hi, I'm Judy, I'm alcoholic, and I'm a l l lesbian. <laughs> and to say it, get it out there, come out. Because when you're in the closet, I tell you, there's so much you're missing in life. and But there was so much threat. You know, I counseled a lot of lesbian women who were maybe a school teacher, but then they'd go to bars, you know, cross-dress and stuff like that at night, because that's what was there. So that was huge, and the same thing in the African-American program. They talked a lot about what it feels like to have descended from slavery in this country. It was a huge part of the program, and, and what it's like being black in America, and still is, the, mm. the slights, the not getting waited on, the higher cost for interest at the bank, all kinds of things. So it was, it was very oh, common. Mm. I was, yeah, and I was, they had a much better success rate. So Native Americans started having Native American treatment programs, and they had women's programs, because women's programs are where women will talk about incest, battering, and abuse. And they typically don't bring that up in mixed groups. So there's been a lot of a good reason to have these separate groups. Later, maybe very later, or in social situations that are focused on recovery, people can get together, but there's such a need to separate it out. Um, so anyhow, they would get together and they had a sober New Year's Eve party. You know, they had uh, other parties during the year. They did sweat lodges together all kinds of things to bond them together in their tradition, in their history, because it honors who they are in some very deep way. I visited a treatment program in New Zealand, a Maori program. He got a hold of my empowerment steps, which, uh, and he invited me out, and they were learning their native language, and they were learning their native dances. In fact, they did a dance that pulled me into the room and it was beautiful, and they were they were feeling so proud and so good about who they were. I mean, it was working on that. So, it's very important that we realize that people need to address those deep, deep issues of oppression that they've struggled with, and with women. So, when I consulted with a lot of treatment programs back in Minnesota. We were working to try to have separate women's groups because like a woman who took fifth steps, she said just about every fifth step with a woman had to do with incest and abuse. Well, that's not exactly her fifth step, it's her pain. You know, that's not her moral inventory, it's somebody else's, but it's how she's been harmed. So women need a safe place. Men need a safe place too because men keep a front up with women and they need a place, they can let that go. So. Yeah, it's a big question. It's a big field. Yeah, and I, I, I can't speak for uh, women, obviously, in general. Um, but, you know, I think for men, a lot of men that, that I've talked to, I think what they're suppressing is the shame that they had of the things that they did. I think that, that yeah, and, and it seems to me, and I'm just reaching here, but it seems to me sort of what you're saying is that for women that the shame and, and the pain they're oppressing, uh, suppressing um, has more to do with what's happened to them. Yes, I would say that's true. And they have done, women have certainly done tacky things, no doubt about it. But the underlying piece is generally the trauma. Okay, and yeah, 
and it's have you it's, have you worked with men as well or mostly with women i work quite a bit with men and mm -hmm. i like working with men um especially men who've had trauma do you find that I, that men are curious about about <laughs> what how women feel because part of recovery is understanding relationships i think well, I think the starting place is finding out how you feel and making friends mm -hmm. with that. Because okay. you need that inside you that you can say, yeah, I feel rotten that I did that. And you can get a way to let go of it. It's like, that's how I was then. That's the best I knew. I don't like that I did it. And I did it. And that's me too. And I forgive myself. You know, we need to be able to make friends with all of that trauma and all of tacky things we've done in our lives and that's true for everybody well i mean As a lot of addicts deal with uh, i'm sorry go ahead no go ahead <laughs> um a, a lot of addicts deal with um first just getting past that point of having the thoughts and the obsession of using again um, even when they don't want to those thoughts kind of like still come up mm -hmm. so can you can you get to that healing place um if you still haven't relieved um, or have that obsession lifted? I think it's it's different for different people, but yes, that beginning mm -hmm. part is so important. And I would add there another treatment program, which is Health Recovery in Minnesota, Minneapolis, which helps heal the physical body. She's written several mm -hmm. books, one called Seven Weeks to Sobriety, and I knew her very well when we were all in Minnesota exploring new ways to do things. She says, you know, there is one cause of relapse and it's cravings. And her program is all about healing the physical body and getting past cravings. Now they do some psychological and group stuff, not, not anywhere near what you might do in a 12 step treatment program. But mm -hmm. she gets people tested out for allergies, for systemic yeast for adrenal fatigue all these things that make you feel lousy it's the same thing that makes me want to go eat sugar you know that when i feel down and i've eaten wrong so she does a lot of education with nutrition and healing the physical body and she works with, with natural substances so it's a fabulous program and people do very well especially the revolving door people who keep going back and back and they just can't stay sober so that's another piece of it. Yeah, there's certainly phases, I would say. So you can't say they're t totally separate, but they overlap. But yes, you've got to dam up the flood, right? If you're always thinking about using, that's a place to start healing the body. And I really recommend going off into naturopaths for this because they are going to work with natural substances in the body and they will deal with things like adrenal fatigue, systemic yeast, that keep people just feeling lousy. I, I hit the wall with that stuff back in 1982. And I'll tell you, you just feel lousy all the time. And that leads you to think thoughts like, well, what? who cares? <laughs> what difference does it make? Or it's just, it's so awful feeling like that, you're just going to use something to hell with it. <laughs> you know, that kind of feeling. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, well, I'll share this one thing, and um, and it'll lead into to my next question. Um, so, my the last cast I did, um, I talked about my quitting smoking recently, and spent a lot of time. Um, really, I just wanted to talk about what it felt like, the physical aspect, the psychological aspect, and I f and I ended up talking a lot more about me and me and me, <laughs> and and um, it was made clear to me um, afterwards that. Uh, I left out my significant other a lot in that conversation, um, who's, you know, who is a woman and, you know, I didn't really share one of the, re the main reasons for my quitting is that it was causing that person a lot of pain because I, I was sneaking smoking a little bit on and off leading up to my relapse, but it wasn't until my relapse that I started chain smoking like crazy. And mm -hmm. so now that this person is, is trying to deal with an addict um, who is effed up multiple times, right? And yeah. and trying to deal with her her um, <clears throat> reconciliation, if that's even the right word, 
Um, and here I am, you know, poisoning myself again. And, you know, I smell bad, you know, my breath smells bad. And, and the, you know, she doesn't want to be around me. It makes her feel very um, uncomfortable. She d- doesn't feel like she's around the me that she met, you know. And mm-hmm. so you're dealing with this guy who just relapsed. And then now you're dealing with this new aspect that wasn't there before. And, um, you know, so it was it was torturous for her. And that was one of the main reasons that I I quit. Uh, if not the main reason why I quit, because it my health, yes, it's important, but my relationship with that person is way more important to me. Um, and so what I what I realized is that you know I I wasn't thinking of, as uh, enough about how she felt, and uh-huh. you know so have you dealt with also with women who have been married to men? Um, but they are on the receiving end of the addiction, you know, not the addict themselves. Oh, sure. I mean, it goes both ways. It's very hard to live with a using addict. It's very hard. I know Al-Anon teaches you can, you know, detach and step aside, but that's very hard. And why would you want to live your life stepping aside and numbing out how you feel? So it was right. good that you your partner said she didn't like it it didn't feel good that's right and that was great for you that hit you somewhere inside it said this is important i've got to do this well I, but i do i do regret my behavior i'm sorry yeah i go ahead yeah no i i was just saying it's it's great it, it hit you and that that you could pull on that because we need something to pull on to do something hard like quit smoking yeah, and and I'm glad that I did too. But I, I, you know, because it was early recovery, I regret my behavior because during that withdrawal, that first week, you know, I, w- I was getting a little nasty. I mean, and I knew I would be cranky, you know. And then I kind of made her feel crappier than she needed to feel, and then you know, making her feel guilty that I'm quitting smoking. Um, and this is a typical behavior, I think, of a using addict. Um, now, granted, we're talking about cigarettes, but um, that sense of like passing on guilt onto somebody else and making them feel bad. Um, I think that that happens with the using addict and sometimes with the, the dry drunk, as they say. Um, sure. And, you know, so it's just so much that we put the people that we care about and we love through. We really tortured them a lot. Right. And then that becomes their life work to understand why they're allowing themselves to be tortured. You know, everyone at some level needs to get responsible. I mean, we're talking about grown-ups now. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you're being difficult and cranky and nasty, well, she needs to do something about it too. I think we all then get our lessons to learn from that. Yeah, it's not present, not pleasant, but she also has to take responsibility and you said she confronted you on it and that's really good did she threaten to leave or did she leave um, I mean not not over that no no of course we're still you know there's still the the um we're still together um but yeah it's it's that idea of well I don't know if this is going to work out because I don't right. know that you, the addict, are reliable. You know, so that's always there. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And it's good she talked about it, and it's good you took her seriously and you quit. But yes, mm-hmm. those things drive relationships apart. Because yeah, it's I, like, and I, I, yeah, I, she, you know, um, I, I won't speak for her, but I will say this: that there. I don't, maybe Al-Anon's, maybe it, it's me, but maybe Al-Anon's just not making it, the process clear enough. I'm not sure. But the idea, like you said, of sort of like stepping aside and, and I understand the the idea of you're basically trying to protect yourself from being, being hurt because you can't control, you know, the sort of letting go. But it seems to me that if you're in that relationship, you really can't, right? I mean, can you, you can you really step aside and, and detach well that's what people talked about and I also heard a lot of women because I interview a zillion people say some of those speaker meetings when the women got up and said oh yes I'm just fine she'd say it wasn't believable she was putting on an act 
because she wanted to be a good Al-Anon person, a good, you know, recovery person. I, the what was his name? He wrote the small book, and he says it's hell to live with a using addict, and I tend to agree with that, having done that. Um, it's like, why would you want to? You know, when you're not getting your needs met, you're not getting someone being kind to you, you're not getting joy, you're, you can't trust the person. One has to really ask why they stay, and often it's back in their history. But I think so you're you, asking a question. I think a lot of the al li- literature sort of, and I read tons of it, kind of chides the woman for being so fussy and, um, you know, even in the quote big book, it's like it says, "Well, don't don't be a nag or a killjoy, or he might consort with other women." It's like this is dated stuff, you know. That just shouldn't. Yeah, that, be I've read that passage before. Yeah, it's a, it is a bit odd, and I you know I try to think of it. Okay, what well, what well, maybe they're just saying, you know, don't in, instigate the problem that's already a problem, you know. But you know, maybe I'm just trying to stretch it so that it it fits my yeah. paradigm. You're stretching it because, from my point <laughs> yeah. of view, okay, from my paradigm, because that was written in, you said, late 1930s. That was a stereotype mm, for women. Yeah. And there was a big argument between Bill Wilson and his wife Lois about who writes that chapter. And she thought that she, being the wife, should write it. And he said, no, no, I want it all to be in the same voice. So he wanted to write it. Well, we're all going to write things that are self serving for us. Of course, he was he womanized, and he didn't want his wife to leave, and so he wrote it up to fit that, you know. Um, don't be a nag or a killjoy, or he might go sleep with other people, which indeed he did, you know. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, we just got to see the humanness and the smile at it because, yeah, people protect their own territory, and he was protecting his his sexual behavior, you know. Well, yeah, it's like it's like giving yourself an out. Yeah, it's like, yeah. so, I mean, I think we should always read everything with a critical eye. Like, who yeah. wrote that? For whose benefit is it? And who gets left out? It's very important. And in some cases, follow the money. But those three things, we need to bring a critical eye to everything. Yeah, I, know, I definitely, yeah. Ag- yeah, I definitely agree with, with that because I, I feel like, um, when you know the person I'm with is blunt and honest with me, even if it's if it if it's really painful because I am forced to recognize my own faults, um, mm-hmm. it you know and it can it can stir up emotions and a sense of insecurity and um, self consciousness and um, you know inferiority of of self not of relationship but of feeling just less than. Um, and then you have so you have all these negative feelings that can be conjured up by someone just reflecting back to you the reality. Um, I would much rather take that, talk to my sponsor about it if I need to. Um, you know, a lot some personal details I do keep to myself. That's that's sacred between you know myself and the person I'm with. Um, but you know, but talking about those feelings, I can talk about those feelings with someone. And to me, that seems to be what the rest of a a and NA and other programs are all about. So why would this one chapter be like, no, don't bother me? <laughs> right. It's, you know, yeah. it, it does seem a bit contradictory. Yeah. It's culture bound. You know, it's just humans mm-hmm. being humans. No one was a god. You know, I I wrote the 16 steps for empowerment. They're they're certainly based on some of them or come from the 12 steps. However, a lot of them are turned around. Um, and <laughs> it's important that uh, we can be open to stuff. But I've had people yell at me, how could you write those? God handed those steps down to Bill Wilson, and how dare you? It's like, I just wrote what seemed right to me, that's all. You know, it, it wasn't yeah. an act of arrogance, it was an act of observation and caring about the women I worked about who I felt often didn't get what they needed out of the steps. They got some things, they got good groups, but they didn't have steps that affirmed their intelligence. It didn't affirm joy, creativity. And you know, this model starts with, we affirm we have the power to take charge of our lives and stop being dependent 
on substances or other people for our self-esteem and security. But well, I'm we glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah, because when if you compare it side by side with um, step one of, of AA, it says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol or substitute whatever addiction there. We were powerless over that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, this is very sort of short and sweet and to the point, whereas yours, when you do your steps, there, it's like there's a little bit more. You The sentences are a little bit longer. There's more words. Was there a reason for that? I went through these words for two or three years. I showed them to zillions of people, and they they cover a lot more ground in a way because I don't like to just say, well, my life is unmanageable. Well, maybe partly it is. I've seen people who needed treatment. I wouldn't say their life was unmanageable. They were still teaching school. It was kind of messy, but it wasn't just a wreck, you know? And mm -hmm. so I like better language than that that includes more. But we affirm yeah. we have the power to take charge of our lives. That's a very strong statement. Um, a friend of mine took this into the prison in Columbus, Ohio. She had found these steps after reading Women, Sex, and Addiction, and she just loved them. So she took them into the prison, and a woman got a hold of them there, and she wrote to me. And I was still writing them. I was still forming them. And she said, that was so wonderful. She said, no one ever told me I had power before. I was always told I was nothing. And that sentence just lifted her up. And it doesn't mean you don't apologize for your harm to others, but this also includes we make a list of people we have harmed and people who have harmed us. And a lot of women apologize for being abused. And women need to say, that was harmful to me. That wasn't okay. And men need to say that too. Because sexual abuse of men has been certainly ignored a lot. And it has a huge, um, it, well, it, it extracts well, a huge price for people. Sure. And especially men with physical abuse. Yes. Um, but the so sexual let me just give it Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no. All right, well, so, um, sexual yeah. abuse with men, there's so much shame around talking about that. Or when mm -hmm. a 15-year-old boy's had sex with a 23-year-old woman, it's sort of like, hey, all sex is good sex. <laughs> What's the problem? And it's very hard for men to see that they were being used. So it's very important for men to understand they've been sexually abused when, say, at 15 years old, they were seduced by a 25-year-old woman or a 30-year-old woman. Because for a lot of men, you know, all sex is good sex, if, if you volunteer. And there's a lot of power difference in that. And it's very hard for men to see that they were used and the woman had power over them. And a lot of these men showed up in the perpetrator group a friend of mine was doing and she said it was so hard to get them to see that because they didn't want to see that a woman could have had power over them so there's so many nuances to working with all of these things with sexual abuse with gender differences race class all these things are huge and i think they need to be addressed one uh i'll go back a little bit one woman I interviewed who actually helped me make a video on the 16 steps, which by the way we have, if people want to see uh, women talking who've been in the groups and led the groups. She was in a newly in recovery back in 92, and she said, well, I think being a lesbian has really contributed to my drug use, and because the shame is so deep. And someone said, hey, don't play that lesbian card here. You're here You're here as an addict to deal with your addiction. Well, she left and never came back. Wow, yeah, so would I. Yeah, fortunately, she found Many Roads, One Journey just shortly after it was published. And it was a lifesaver for her because it affirmed what she was thinking. And she started a group for lesbians to really look at and talk to with each other the pain they had lived with and the shame they had lived with. And they were very successful in staying sober. So, I you know, I, we, yeah. go ahead. 
Yeah, I think I think you sort of illustrated for me um, the importance of why why you designed a separate uh, sixteen step program because. You know, I always think of the 12-step program as I use as being open. Anyone can believe what they want. Um, sexuality doesn't matter. You know, gender, blah, blah, blah. But then again, I'm in New York, New York City. Um, and it's, you know, 2015, 16. And, and you're a man. <laughs> and, I'm a, and I'm a man, yes. Um, but, you know, in the meetings that I go to, I, I do see, you know, sex, you know um, sexual orientation of different kinds. Um, and it's, everyone seems to be comfortable but, you know, on occasion, you will have someone say something sort of out of turn, um, mean or, um, you know, uh, not intentionally mean, but, you know, sort of uh, ignorant. And, um, and then someone can get hurt or offended. And I think the concern is for, especially for the newcomers coming into a program, whereas if you have a 16-step program like you've designed you've created a construct so that anybody walking into that knows where where the boundaries are and there's a certain amount of respect built into it i think for a lot of things i think i think when it's all women it it becomes a safer place too for for many people you know it's human and there's going to be um a lot of offenses that happen for example one woman went to her first AA meeting, and it was, oh, we're in the program, and hug, hug, everyone to hug her. And she was an incest survivor. She said, she never went back either. She said, everyone just thinks they can hug you whether they ask you or not. And I think a lot of people don't realize the discomfort, because we need to remember that, what, only 15, 20% of people who go to AA stay in AA, you know, and get wonderful help, and get better, and get well, or get sober and stay sober but there are so many people who go in and don't stay and they're not going to say anything i had a cousin who went in and he said um i have a lot of cousins <laughs> but he he went once he he got oh it was the lord's prayer and everything like that and he had left christian churches and he started saying boy it sure sounds a lot like that and he didn't want to be there it just didn't feel good to him he didn't feel he he had a voice there there was a way you should say things a way you should be you know there's program talk and you know i so, think people can um if you come out of a fundamentalist background all right and you hear program talk and these things and they're rigid it just fits in with what you've always learned about being rigid you know now if you come in with a little more breadth of thought and education possibly you can juggle some of the stuff and step past it and don't take it seriously okay but for some people boy they grab onto that and it's just dogmatic especially early on because remember i was interviewing people in groups back in the 80s and a lot of women talked about um and men too someone becomes sort of the leader and he would say what was right and wrong and so forth. And there were problems with sponsors. Some sponsors were great. Others, I mean, they didn't have the wisdom and knowledge really to help someone else along that much. And it didn't work out very well. It's, you know, it's a big system and a lot of, a lot of good in it and a lot of uh, loose places where things can go wrong. So it's, we're all working on our stuff, you know, and especially gender differences. And I think it's really important that we keep paying attention to those. Because as we see, they're not solved yet. You know, if one in four women in a university going to college is going to be sexually assaulted, we're a long ways from getting it together in terms of uh, gender and equality and safety for women. It's like choose. Choose what works for you. Um, Calo Freire in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed writes that anything that blocks free inquiry is a form of violence. And I so agree with that. I don't know what was with me as a growing up kid, but I asked questions and I inquired and I always wanted to know why. And when people would just shut me up all the time, you know, it's like it felt violent. 
It's like I had a mind and I had thoughts and they weren't taken seriously. And so I think that's a piece that the 12 steps could certainly do some working on. <clears throat> also, but then I'll go back to my own piece. Mine is much more of a developmental model. For example, the 12 steps, if you say kind of the level of development, a lot of it is loyalty, which is good, um, conformity, external locus of control, meaning you do the way it says to do. You use their words, you do the steps, you believe what they say. Like if you don't go to groups, you're going to drink. Well, that's not necessarily true. You're not necessarily going to drink. So all those things are like early adolescence, right? Conformity, don't rock the boat, all those kinds of things. Later in developmental stages, <clears throat> like teens, later teens, people go through often a very strong sense of noticing what's unfair in the culture. And they ask questions and they're disillusioned by a lot of things that they took for granted. And that's a very important step in becoming a mature human being that has an inner world, that has beliefs, because they're based on observation and experience. And so it's like, what do you see? What do you think? What, what feels right for you? That's what I wish we'd ask everyone. I mean, my dream, I say this in workshops, is in a treatment program, put up a section on every kind of recovery program. And there are a lot of them, but they're also not um, talked about in 12-step programs. And just say, go read those things. Read what they say. See what fits for you. See what feels right, what grabs you. And I think that would be so empowering to people. It's assuming they can do that. And I, what I hear back as a response from treatment people is, well, people are too messed up to be able to do that. Well, I think that's an that's a expectation that will fulfill itself. But, you know, I don't think that's true. So people I work with, I can talk about different programs and they'll listen with interest. They can read. They can think. They can feel. And I assume they can do that. So it, it, it's different, you know, we, we come in with heavy assumptions and uh, we have to realize how much we're controlling what people think they can do. That's a yeah. long piece. <laughs> no, it makes sense. Um, but I do know with my program, you know, I, like we talked about earlier, some things that I may disagree with, um, you know, I kind of just, you know, uh, ignore them, you know, or or try to interpret them in another way because I just think to myself, okay, what's more important, you know, uh, disagreeing with the, some things here and there or my actual recovery, you know, so I, I choose my recovery as being more important. Um, but yeah, again, like when it's early recovery and people are first getting exposure to these programs, if it was more inviting, um, then maybe more people would stay and work it longer. Hopefully. Yeah. But any, anything to keep people on the path. I mean, this addiction stuff is just, it's so horrendous. You know, there wasn't meth when I was in high school. You know, we, maybe senior year, we snuck a bottle of vodka out of our parents' thing and threw some of it in the punch. I mean, that was our big deal, you know? And it was nothing like kids are doing now. And nobody was smoking pot to, you know, mm -hmm. speak up grass grew on the ground it was like it was just a different world and certainly there were some alcohol problems in some families but it wasn't anything like it is also the sexual stuff I think is contributing to addictions because this sexting in high school I interviewed a couple counselors and he said oh my god it's our one of our biggest headaches here you know he said 10 years ago you never heard of it and now, you know, these boys, you know, they're just mostly being adolescents, but, you know, inappropriate. But the girls are being inappropriate, and they don't have good boundaries. And so then he shows the photograph to his 20 best friends, and then he gets arrested for pornography. And, you know, he's in big trouble at 17 as a sexual perpetrator. And 
it's probably something that could have been helped if both the female and the male had a ton of education, had a ton of um, talking about all this and getting the danger. But, I mean, these things are becoming huge problems. So I, I, I wanted to go back to um, also the idea of being, um, you know, having alternative uh, religious views. Um, so, like, again, like if I were Wiccan or Pagan, um, do, do you know, are there groups out there that are using your 16-step program on their yes. own and just sort of forming their own groups? Yes, they go online. There's someone who actually stole most of the steps for for him. And uh, <laughs> no, there are a lot. There, I have in my, uh, I have a workbook that has the set 16 steps. It has exercises that go with every step so you can really work them you know, very specifically. And then I put in announcements people sent me, sent me, and one was a Wiccan group. They just sent me one. I, I got an announcement from a, a age group that was in recovery, was using them. They've been used in high schools for people. They've been used a lot in shelters for women. I mean, well, think about, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Sean. Well, Think about when a woman goes to a shelter. She's been abused. She's been battered. She's been put down, generally. Mm -hmm. To stand up, and I, I often go to programs, by the way. When I give a workshop, I ask, Lee, just take me to a shelter or something and arrange that. So I, just as a community service, to go work with some women. And we'll start with that phrase. We affirm we have the power to take charge of our lives. We get up in a circle and we get into our bodies. Yes, we can do it. The thing. We raise the roof. People get up and in their bodies. And yes, I can do this and feel it inside them. It's great. I love doing that. You know, it's it's such a welcome piece for people. Well, yeah, I have to ask you about that too because in the traditional 12-step program, there's the idea of sort of putting your will aside and letting the a higher power step in. Um, and you hear it all the time. It's like, you know, I, I, I try, kept trying to do, do it on my own and I kept messing up. So I'm putting my will aside. I'm letting the higher power step in and guide me or, you know, let their will be not mine or something along those lines. And, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird sort of uh, paradox, I think, because, you know, one, you have to have the will to make the choice to be in recovery. And then you're giving up your will. Or are you giving up your will to let the higher power come in and guide you? Um, so how do you do you deal with that in your 16 steps? Do you feel like you've sort of uh, balanced those two things, your your will and using a guidance from a, a higher power? Well, I think when we learn to listen to our gut and our instincts and stop rationalizing, stop making up excuses, we, sh we hear the voice of spirit is within us, you know? And so it doesn't say God out there is going to help you. Because I don't, I never got that in Sunday school. Well, does God talk to me? Or how do I know what God wants? Or, you know, am I going to read the Bible and learn that? But I think what was so big in the feminist movement is find your voice. Because your voice is one with spirit. And I have been connected to Quakers. I've been connected to Quakers since, what, 1980. And it's all about listening to that still, small voice within you. That's what I believe in. And that's why that second step, we said God or Great Spirit or Higher Power or whatever awakens the healing wisdom within us. And it's when we listen to ourselves. I think that's the big thing. You know, I, su I submitted the Many Roads, One Journey book to Albert Ellis, the famous cognitive therapist way back when. He wrote back this incredible letter. God, I wish I could find it. But it was about four pages of just taking me to task for all that superstition and stuff like that. You know, secular sobriety also works. People get well without that. I think what we do need, though, is our self-respect, our voice, that kind of thing. Get over our shame. So it's in there. But I don't say, God, tell me what to do. I say, listen. 
and I, I sit with a Buddhist group, it's you're listening. You're being inside yourself. You just go into the silence, and then things arise. And I always had that experience, just uh, like the Navajo mother said to her daughter when she asked a question, put it in your holy middle and sleep on it, and let it come mm -hmm. to you. And I love that. So it's Put not it like, in your holy middle and sleep on it and let it come to you. Yes. Hmm. That's that's where I come from. So it's, you know, however you get there, however you get there. I do agree we can't just live in our ego, okay? Because then there's, I've got to protect my ego. I've got to protect my identity. I've got to do all that. But an open heart, an open mind, to learn from others. Because one thing I, I must say I have been troubled with in the 12 step programs is how for sure they are that they're right and that it's the one and only way. And I've spoken at a lot of addiction conferences and I go around and um, ask people, do you ever let people know about other models? Oh, Oh, well, well, and they'll sort of say, well, uh, yes. I'll say, well, which ones? And, well, um, well, they can go look it up if they want to. I mean, there's not, there's not an inclusiveness. So I found a lot of rigidity in the programs of even thinking about other programs. Now, interestingly, at the South Bend, Indiana Y, which is important for people to know about, it's a fine treatment program. A woman went there who didn't even know the 12 steps to be the director because she was a mighty good organizer director. Well, she read the 12 steps just out of the blue, right? She said, why are we telling women to say they're powerless? We don't say that in the program for women who've been assaulted. She said, it seems to me we need to help affirm women's power and stuff. So she went online and she found my steps and she called me. And I talked to her at length. She was so thankful. And then they got a grant and brought me out. And I did a training for staff and everyone. And they, it's a 16-step model now. And they had a 500% increase of women staying in aftercare who used that mo model. And the other part that was so beautiful to see, because I have one on creativity, because affirming the, create, the creative spirit, my gosh, when we... Let ourselves think outside the box and be creative. That brings us alive. You can hear it in my voice right now. It sparks us inside. Well, the things they had done, they had painted designs on some of the sidewalks, the chairs, made things. They were having a wonderful time being creative. And it was lighthearted. It wasn't so serious. And I think that's important. I judge a lot of things, uh, judge maybe not the best word, but on how much people can relax and laugh. You know, how they can not take themselves too seriously. Yes, seriously, but not all the time. And yeah, that's very well, important. But when you talk about creativity, um, like what, what are you thinking? Can, can you give any examples at all? Or Sure. Well, one was they painted designs on the sidewalks of their, where they lived. And then another one, they actually painted the chairs. And then another woman, um, she had a box that she brought to a workshop I gave because she was in the area and she led the groups and led zillions of these groups and all kinds of things to make just cutouts and drawings and a woman has sent to me a mandala for every step twice I have two sets of mandalas that she has made on these steps you know it's just beautiful so someone sent me a photograph he was obviously a good photographer, photographer of a mountain scene with clouds. And he said, this is how the, these steps feel to me. And thank you. You've helped me on my path. It was so nice, you know. Um, all kinds of creativity. I don't care if it's coloring in a coloring book, doing cutouts, painting on the walls. They had painted m many of the chairs there. They had beautifully painted them. So they did really creative stuff. They made masks one time. You have to, and that was a program where a lot of those women had been on the streets. So for these women, this may be the first time really, they had this wonderful teacher to help them be creative, to get out of the, the ego and get out of the mind and just 
let loose that way. It was a wonderful thing. They also did a lot for healing the physical body. They had acupuncture. They had someone come in and do it in a group. Oh, wow. Was, really? Yeah. This is where creativity from the staff gets really important. And then they also learned skills while they lived there, which is more of an inpatient. But it was more of a, um, not just inpatient, it was where people, how would I put it? It was more like a home where you're learning to cook, you're learning to sew, you're learning to do all kinds of things that can get you jobs. And so it, it's an amazing program. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting interesting thought to think that um, appealing thought that maybe you know branching off of the typical AA or NA meetings that you have you know these sort of community meetings amongst addicts where you can teach each other things learn things yeah be creative together um, you know but since um, these programs are you know self-supporting basically by people coming into room and just donating whatever they can a dollar two dollars you know per meeting um, there's not much room for like hiring people to come in and and do things for them but I do love the idea of you know maybe encouraging people to you know share some of their um, Reiki practices or energy healing practices or or whatever it might be crystal work you know things like that I think that's a really a cool idea um, you know but do you do that under the aus- auspice yeah. of of this is a meeting or is it just something that hey let's do this together as a side thing right I think it's important that you keep a structure in place because self-led groups then rely on the structure to hold them together okay so I think it's more that there there's one day they do that creativity step all right and which one is it yeah, we re- we affirm and enjoy our intelligence, strengths, and creativity, remembering not to hide these qualities from ourselves and others. So you can go to that step and see where there are various exercises you can do. But you could say this woman would bring in a box of things that they could do that were creative. So just for that day and just focus. It's kind of not all over the map, anyone doing anything. But I think it's open that people can talk about those things. Like if someone's done a crystal healing, now that may be kind of off the wall to a lot of other people, but they're not going to say that. They're going to listen. And I think that's what's important. You know, it may not be something I would do, but... If someone's doing it and it seems to help, you know, we can get sort of far out there too with all this stuff. And I think it is important to kind of keep it contained, but have openings. Right. Yeah. Because I think when you're in recovery, you have to feel grounded, you know. And and yeah, I I feel like if you're sort of going from one thing to the other and testing this and testing that, then it's hard to, to really just get your energy grounded. No, this needs to be very grounded. And I appreciate you brought that up. Now, one group, for instance, though, rent did it differently. They didn't go straight through the steps. They had whoever led the group that week, who was kind of the, I don't know what they called it, the trusted servant. They called it just who led the group. They've picked steps 10 and 12 for about two months straight. And they were all in troubled relationships, and that helped with those. Um, we learn to trust our reality and daily affirm that we see what we see, we know what we know, and we feel what we feel. That was invaluable for women in battering relationships. I see that you're hurting me, and no, I, I'm not being too sensitive, I'm not being too um, fussy, I, you know, I'm not being mean to you. I see this and I know what I know and I feel hurt and I don't like this and you're doing it to me. It's very important that people be able to say that. And if you look at the video, we had to edit out several people saying they loved that step the most because there were so many. They said, oh, the step just saved my life. Yes, it's my reality. I get to have my reality. So it was 
It's great. And they did this for weeks in a row because that's what women wanted to do in the group. You know, some groups went, I led a group here. We went straight through the steps a couple times. That was great. Um, well, th- this video, where where is the video that people can watch? I have it. I sell it. It's, okay. So uh, through your website? Yeah, through my website. There's two. There's an old one I gave back in Chico. It's not very edited, but I go through every step and talk about it. And the, the quality isn't great, but it's it's still a powerful video. Then we had a professional one, make one here, that I'd still like to edit up a little bit more, but it's about an hour, 50 minutes. A lot of people watch it who are thinking of starting a group, and it's a good one to watch. It's, you okay, see good. two different groups, yeah. It's it's a powerful it's a powerful video. Okay, and the I website think, is Charlotte Castle K Charlotte with the and Castle with a K CharlotteCastle dot com. K A S L four letters. C H A R L O T T E K A S L dot com. Right. Okay. If you forget that. Just type in sixteen steps. You'll find me. <laughs> and it'll pop up. Type in empowerment for recovery. You'll find me. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Um, and I oh. wanted to ask you this uh, one last question as we wrap up here. Um, okay. So okay. what do you feel, um, particularly for women, um, but also in general, what do you feel is lacking spiritually um, for women and most people? Well, that's a big question, spiritually. I hardly use that term. Hmm. It is a broad term. I'll admit yeah, that. it's yeah. a broad term. It means so much. But I think we, I go back to Quakers. We go need to go inside, turn off all the noise, and listen inside to what's going on. Because we can learn to hear the counterfeit voices and that true voice of our center. Yeah. And I knew the true voice of my center when I said, okay, I'm going to move back to Montana now. I woke up. It was clear. You know, it took me a couple of years to do it. But I just knew that was it. I knew I would found the right answer. And if we're in the habit of quiet, you know, and I like movies and sound and all that, but I like a lot of quiet and listening, 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 because my writing requires me to listen. I'm trying to hear things, and I hear other people. So I think I think that would be the biggest thing for everyone is turn off the sound and just listen to your body. Listen to your stomach if it aches. Listen to your arms, your shoulders, your tension. Listen mm. to if you're clenching your jaw. There's the wisdom of your body talking to you. It really will tell you a lot. Yes, I do, I do my share of uh, jaw clenching. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny you talking about the stomach too because I had mentioned in earlier episodes um, I had this this thing that I realized somewhere after um, after relapsing and, and going to rehab uh, if I was starting to feel sort of anxious you know and you get that anxious feeling in your stomach um, yep. I would literally let go of my the my holding on to my muscles um, yep in my stomach and you know let my stomach like just go out and be as buddha you know you know fat buddha style as possible and Mm -hmm. or happy buddha is if i think the actual name and um (laughs) and and i would all immediately feel a release of that of tension just by making a physical change i could i could feel like my anxiety just sort of slip away oh that's fabulous and i i think that's so true to be in tune with this body and what you can do to let things loosen up and drop the lower the anxiety and what you can even do helping with the depression let me leave you with one last thought that came to me because then I'm I need to go um, I had a I adopted a child who didn't attach and it was really really tough I was a single parent I was working going to school etc and she, in adolescence, was in a lot of trouble and juvenile detention and all kinds of stuff. Well, I, for some reason, took the 23rd Psalm and, and said it over and over and over. 
the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, I don't even consider myself a Christian, but it doesn't matter because that's been said millions of times. And I thought, shepherd, yes, shepherd, you know, we all need a shepherd because we're all lost. I was certainly lost. And I shall not want, which before I even got connected to Buddhism was like, yeah, I shall not want her to be different. I shall not want her to not be in juvenile detention. I shall not demand that I be different. And just listening to myself say, I'm not demanding this, I'm not demanding that. I'm taking it as it is this minute. She's there. I'm here. You know, I've got a stomachache. Whatever. And I worked with that so much. And I noticed online they have some interpretations of the 23rd Psalm. Well, there's something I use. I sang a lot in the house. No one ever recommends that, but I do. And I sang the part of, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Sing Alleluia, Alleluia. I sang that over and over. Well, the act of singing is really great. And doing anything but thinking about what's gone wrong is great. And it was comforting and it centered me. Because what you're trying to do when you're feeling, you know, life is pretty rough is get centered, get centered. So you're kind of the eye of the tornado. It's going on, but you're sitting there in a calm place. And I'm starting a book on this whole story of bringing up my daughter. And wow, it's such a story. <laughs> She's dead now, but she has five kids by five different men. So that's winding its way into my life. So I want to thank you for um, asking me, and I would love to do more of this. Yeah, I'd love to uh, do another part like you had suggested. Um, maybe we'll just go through all 16 steps and just do them one by one at a time. That'd be great. That'd be great. And I do you need it? I'll, well, I'll talk to you later. I'll send you a copy of the workbook. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, great. thank and you. It, yeah, hey, yeah. My pleasure. All right, so that's it for Spiritual Bazaar. Um, again, if you want to get more information about Charlotte Castle, just go to charlottecastle, K-A-S-L dot com. Um, and her biography is up there. Her books are up there. Um, everything you need to know about her is pretty much up there. Um, there's also some videos on YouTube. And, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks again, Charlotte, for coming on. Take care. Thank you. All right, that's it for Spiritual Bazaar. This is A. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. Uh, also, subscribe on iTunes and rate us, leave us a comment, um, or whatever you know streaming service you're using for podcasts. Um, I'd love to get your feedback. I'd love to hear what you have to say about the show. Um, what's valuable to you? What do you want to hear more about? Um, are there any authors or um, experts that you'd like to hear from and have on the show? Let me know. And um, again, please go ahead and email me at spiritualbizarr at aol.com and send me your comments, share your stories. Um, this is a community, you know, this is, this is about getting better as not just an addict, but as a human being, um, you know, which is why the shows that, that I'm doing are, are wide ranging um, because we, for many of us we have our 12 step recovery program um, but to be, to be able to expand beyond that and bring more supplementary information and practices uh, and knowledge I think makes for a more wholesome program as Charlotte Castle was um, speaking to so again thanks for listening this is A and be well everyone
conheceu 